is called Bodies Are Cool. And um, this is a great story for I Spy. If you've ever played I Spy with my little eye. Um, when we play this, uh, when we read this story with the little ones in um, my family at this point in time, we have several bodily differences that we don't often see in picture books. So we look for G-tubes, hearing aids, insulin pumps, we look for ostomy bags, and we look for limb differences, um, which might be differences in our hands or our ears or our feet. Um, so I invite you to engage in I Spy in this book for those things about your body that you don't often see represented in a book. And I also invite you while we're reading to uh, join me in the refrain, Bodies Are Cool, which is on every page. Let's begin. Big bodies, small bodies, dancing, playing, happy bodies. Look at all these different bodies. Bodies are cool. Lanky bodies, squat bodies, tall, short, wide, or narrow bodies, somewhere in the middle bodies. Bodies are cool. Round bodies, muscled bodies, curvy curves and straight bodies, jiggly, wiggly, fat bodies. Bodies are cool. Dark skin, olive skin, every shade of brown skin, pinky pale or peach skin. Bodies are cool. Poofy hair, wavy hair, springy curls and flat hair, lots of hair or no hair. Bodies are cool. Leg hair, armpit hair, fuzzy lip and chin hair, brows meet in the middle hair. Bodies are cool. Hazel eyes, brown eyes, monolids and round eyes. Blind and wearing glasses eyes. Bodies are cool. Crooked faces, bump nose faces, flat nose, full lips, gap, gap tooth faces, stick out ears and thin lipped faces. Bodies are cool. Freckled bodies, dotted bodies, rosy patched or speckled bodies, dark skin swirled with light skin bodies. Bodies are cool. Hairy fingers, wrinkly fingers, dimpled elbows, chubby fingers, wobbly arms and stubby fingers. Bodies are cool. Soft tummies, saggy tummies, flat or sticky outie tummies, innies, outies, pregnant tummies. Bodies are cool. Thick legs, scrawny legs, knobby knees and long legs. Roll up to the table legs. Bodies are cool. Faint scars, bold scars, stripes from getting bigger scars, marks that tell a, a story scars. Bodies are cool. This body, that body, his and her and their body. However you define your body, bodies are cool. Growing bodies, aging bodies, features rearranging bodies, magic ever-changing bodies. Bodies are cool. My body, your body, every different kind of body, all of them are good bodies. Bodies are cool. So ends the story and let's sing together this little light of mine. Good morning. 
As the new year begins, we are grateful for the technology that allows us to be together, even when the weather wants to conspire against that happening. And as this new year begins, let us not let our quest for justice and fairness and equity prevent us from practicing liberating love. May we refrain from engaging the world and other people through ideology and instead remember the primacy of love. It's easy to fall into proclaiming our values by naming what we hate, calling what side we're on, and calling out others for inferior attitudes. May our hearts soften so that we proclaim our values by how much effort we put into understanding, accepting, and loving others. May we all take to heart James Baldwin's words, that love is the work of mirroring and magnifying each other's light, gentle work, steadfast work, life-saving work in those moments when life and shame and sorrow occlude our own light from our view, but there is still a clear-eyed loving person to beam it back. In our best moments, we are that person for one another. Once again, we come before each other offering what light we have and letting others know where our light grows dim. I invite you at this time to share briefly in the chat the milestones, markers, joys, and sorrows in your heart, and I will do my best to give voice to them as I see them. The first reading we have today is an excerpt from what we don't talk about when we talk about fat by Aubrey Gordon. Fat people, especially very fat people like me, are frequently met with screwed up faces insisting on health and concern. Often we defend ourselves by insisting that concerns about our health are wrongheaded, rooted in faulty and broad assumptions. We rattle off test results and hospital records, citing proudly that we've never had a heart attack, hypertension, or diabetes. We proudly recite, recite our gym schedules and contents of our refrigerators. Many fat people live free from the complications popularly associated with their bodies. Many fat people don't have diabetes just as many fat people do have loving partners despite common depictions of us. Although we are not thin, we proudly report that we are happy and we are healthy. We insist on our goodness by relying on our health. But what we mean is that we are tired of automatically being seen as sick. We are exhausted from the work of carrying bodies that can only be seen as doomed. We are tired of being heralded as dead men walking, undead specters from someone else's morality tale. This morning, we will be sharing our, our plate with the Center for Empowerment and Education. Christina Cabral is here with us today and will tell us about them and their work. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's such an honor to be here, to be invited to for the Share the Plate. I'm from the Center for Empowerment and Education, which is a nonprofit organization based here in Danbury. But we serve 11 towns in our area, um, Bethel, Richfield, New for you name it. Um, so we are your agency um, of domestic violence and sexual assault um, in Connecticut. We are the only dual agency in this area and our services are free and confidential. And our mission is to break the cycle of interpersonal violence through empowerment and education and support services. Um, so as I see your services, it's is for all individuals and so our center. We serve all individuals from 
any gender backgrounds, ethnicity, beliefs. And as I said, it's free and confidential. No one will never, ever receive a bill from us. Um, we have services to support and um, educate people on domestic violence and sexual assault. And we say, sometimes we say, even if you're not going through any of this, but you have a friend or a neighbor or someone in your community that you think might be going through a difficult situation in, or you're not sure if their relationship or your own relationship is healthy, you can give us a call. We have a 24-7 hotline service and our services are a trilingual. We speak Spanish, Portuguese, and English. Um, we do have a walking um, services as well. You can either call us or walk in or call for an appointment and there's always gonna be someone to talk to you. Um, we are located at 2 West Street, uh, next door from the Danbury Library. But we also have a satellite office inside the Danbury Supreme Court um, in the Danbury Police Department and uh, at the Westcon. And we also provide services, uh, prevention education programs from kindergarten to 12th grade, uh, as well as um, Westcon and Nogatak Valley, the college in our area. And when we go to the schools, we have something similar to what you just, uh, the story we just heard for kindergartners. We have book readings on empathy um, and first grade and second grade also. Uh, we are the boss of our bodies and kindness. And um, so as they get older, we talk about uh, friend, uh, healthy friendships, uh, conflict resolution, Solutions, um, and even older middle school and high school, we go deeper into um, the um, healthy relationships and dating abuse or technology and safety, things that it helps them to navigate life, um, giving them the support they need. And as I said, we go into the schools and the services are all free. Sometimes we do have disclosure from students, even teachers, and we refer them um, to the appropriate service. We do have individual counseling. We have um, group counseling. And we also have our residential facility that we have 21 beds for women and their kids. We don't have mail facility in Danbury, but we do refer mails to other facilities. Um, we also, we don't give legal advice and we do not uh, serve the abusers. However, we don't leave them just hanging there. We, we do refer them to the center of safety community. So, we believe that everyone needs support. Even if you are the one making mistakes, there's always help out there. So we don't let anyone go without receiving any help from us. So it's a pleasure to be here this morning. Um, we do have our education program, as I said, as part of this is reaching out to our community. And we also have professional trainings for anyone out there in the health community or health professionals or religious communities. We can come in and um, give you uh, help you to identify um, interpersonal violence and how to refer um, for people to services. So feel free. Feel free to connect with us. Give us a call or email us. I'll be happy to help you. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. That's very interesting. I didn't know about your program. Let us extend our generosity this morning to our share, the plate partner, 
as we continue to support the work of this congregation. You may use the link or QR code that is posted on the, on the screen or the link in the chat. You may also email, or I mean, I'm sorry, not email, mail a check to UUCD at 24 Clapperd Ridge Road in Danbury. Thank you so much for doing your part to support and sustain this community that we love. Lizzo is the stage name of American rapper, singer, and flautist, Melissa Vivian Jefferson. She's 35 and she's won four Grammys, two Soul Train Awards, a Billboard Award, a BET Award, and been nominated for scores of others. She's performed at the Glastonbury Festival and headlined Pride Festivals in Indianapolis and Sacramento. She was a musical guest on Saturday Night Live. She's glamorous, loves fashion, favors heavy makeup, her costumes live in the same neighborhood as those worn by Madonna, Lady Gaga, and Dua Lipa. And she's fat. Her Instagram handle is Lizzo B. Eating. She has an Amazon Prime reality show called Lizzo's Watch Out for the Big Girls, in which plus-size women audition and compete to become backup dancers for her stage show. <clears throat> It says a lot that she's notable for being a sexy pop star who's fat. But what it says is that fat people shouldn't dress to be sexy, shouldn't dance, and shouldn't live out loud about who they are. Her dog died on Christmas Eve. And I recently learned she's being sued by former employees for sexual harassment and weight shaming, of all things. She denies the charges. 
She says, I'm a proud black woman. I love my plus size body and I celebrate every inch of it as sexy and beautiful. I believe in hard work, striving for perfection and constantly pushing myself to do better. I've been a fan since she burst on the scene about five years ago. I really hope these accusations are not true. But if they are, it fits the pattern of people who being oppressed for whatever reason internalize that oppression and inferiority and end up practicing it on others. When I learned about the accusations, I was really bummed out because it's been wonderful having a bona fide A-list fat superstar. I grew up as a fat kid and all there was at the time was Fat Albert and well, he was a cartoon and kind of a cartoonish version of a fat person. As a kid, I got called lots of names, pudgy, husky, pleasingly plump, stout, portly, roly-poly, tubby, and all kinds of versions of fat so fatty and whatnot. The kids use most versions of fat and fat so and stuff, but it was the verbal contortions the adults went into that always bothered me the most. On my 10th birthday, I went to Kmart with my mom. I have no memory whatsoever of what I bought with the money my grandmother had sent. But I vividly remember what we did next. After Kmart, we went next doors to Baroni's, our pharmacies, which was next door. We called it the drugstore before they sold the business to CVS. We got our medicine there, but we also got comic books and hot dogs and ice cream. And on that late afternoon of my 10th birthday, my mom bought me the latest issue of The Amazing Spider-Man and a chocolate milkshake. Baroni's made the best milkshakes. Better than Friendly's, better than anybody's. They were awesome. On the way back to the car, we passed Mr. Fournier. Mr. Fournier was the coach of a team in my little league. He looked at me and said, hey, Pudge, that milkshake ain't doing you any good. You're chubby enough. You gotta be able to move behind the plate. I was a catcher and run out ground balls. And he winked at me and smiled. It was bad enough when other kids made fun of me for being fat. It was worse when the adults did it. I thought of throwing the milkshake at him for a second, but why would I waste half the milkshake? And I stood paralyzed in what I can now name as shame. My mom tugged my arm and she gave Mr. Fournier the same look she gave me when I was in big trouble. And she pulled me along to the car. <clears throat> Each month, I extend a spiritual challenge based on the monthly theme. This month's challenge is to do an examination of your conscience for lingering under the radar prejudices. And to get you going, I suggested the topics of fatness, poverty, and being uneducated. Most good-hearted people are aware of prejudice and understand that even the best of us have certain biases, sometimes unconscious, that inform our attitudes and behavior. You've probably done some or maybe even a great deal of work on unlearning white supremacy culture, engaging in combating racism and sexism and homophobia and transphobia and Islamophobia and anti-Semitism <clears throat> and all kinds of other glaring prejudice. But my challenge to you this month is to look underneath those, underneath the prejudices that loom large at the front of consciousness and take a peek under the psychic bed and into the mental closet for persistent prejudice and bias that tend to get overlooked especially by folks with a more open-minded worldview. And I think one of those is fat. Reflect with me for a minute. Do you harbor any biases towards fat people? Don't assume you're good on this. I'm fat and I know I still do some of these. Do you sometimes see a fat person and think, wow, they'd be great looking if they lost some weight. Do you think weight loss is a matter of diet and willpower? Do you misunderstand what causes obesity? Do you think fat people should have to pay for two seats on the train, the plane, and at the sporting event? Even during or after my message today, might you be thinking, oh, yes, 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 you're right. We shouldn't be cruel to anyone and making fun of people for being fat is wrong. 
but but really fat is just unhealthy. It's not okay to tell people it's okay to be fat. I'm tolerant and I don't come out and say mean things to fat people. Like, whoa, fat people don't wanna be tolerated. We want to be included. We want to be able to walk into any clothing store, or any clothing store website and find something in our size. Have you noticed I usually only wear two sports coats? I can't find anything in my size of decent quality that's in my price range and fits me across the tummy, across the shoulders and the length of the arms without having to get everything altered. It's interesting to live like that. There's a great little questionnaire published by IDR Labs that gets you thinking about your own ideas about weight, fat, and body image and acceptance. The link I can post in the chat. There you go. <clears throat> Sabrina Strings and Linda Bacon write in Scientific American that bias against fat people is actually a larger driver of the so-called obesity epidemic than adiposity itself. A 2015 study in psychological science, among the many studies supporting this argument, found that people who reported experienced weight discrimination had a 60% increased risk of dying, independent of BMI and regardless of body size. The underlying mechanisms explaining this relationship may reflect the direct and indirect effects of chronic social stress. Chronic diseases such as diabetes or heart conditions are mislabeled lifestyle diseases when behaviors aren't necessarily the central problem. Difficult life circumstances cause disease. In other words, the predominant reason they write that black women get sick is not because they eat the wrong things, but because their lives are often stressful and neighborhoods polluted and circumstances full of various factors. Sarah Bartman was an enslaved black woman from the Eastern Cape of South Africa. With ample bosom and large rear end, she was said to be an example of a primitive African body type. She was put on display around Europe in the early 18th century in freak shows and labeled the hot and tot Venus. People paid extra money to poke her with a stick or a finger, and eventually she was prostituted. She died at 26 in 1815. Scientists preserved various parts of her body and her remains were used to support racist theories about Africans and black bodies. In 2002, after a decade of requests, her remains were returned to South Africa. Yvette Dion's 2019 essay, Here's What Fat Acceptance Is and Isn't in Yes Magazine reports a number of fascinating studies. Here's a couple. 2010, Michigan University found kids who are obese were 65% more likely to be bullied than their peers of normal weight. And overweight kids were 13% more likely to be bullied. A USC study from the film department of the top 100 films released in 2016 found only two women larger than a size 14 cast as a lead or co-lead. And of the 50 top TV shows that year, only three women leads were larger than a size 14. In 2017, Fairy Good Boss found that fat employees earn $1.25 on average less per hour for doing the same jobs as non-fat. A 2003 study found 50% of primary care physicians surveyed viewed obese patients as, quote, awkward, unattractive, ugly, and non-compliant. You can still be fired for being fat in 49 states. Yay, Michigan! There are cities and a few states considering anti-fat discrimination laws, but as of right now, existing federal and local anti-discrimination laws consistently do not hold up in court when tested by fat people suing employers. I think that when fat people try to lose weight, we're not usually trying to lose weight for its own sake, merit worthy or not. What we're trying to do is lose the discrimination and mistreatment and microaggressions we suffer because of size. 
I was once told by a member of a congregation I served that the congregation would benefit if I was not so fat because fat people aren't good for marketing. This was said to me with a straight face at coffee hour by a fat person. The vast majority of people who lose substantial amounts of weight gain it back. The diet and exercise mantra has not led to a decrease in obesity rates. We need to reevaluate the way we approach fat. When is weight truly causing and not a symptom of poor health? We assume fat is always bad, so we don't yet fully study people how, say, like my wife, and I talk with her with her permission, can be overweight and have normal blood pressure and normal blood sugar, and yet run half marathons and swim a mile and a half for exercise four to five times a week. Our assumptions and prejudices get in the way of using science to figure out the real answers. How prevalent is fat shaming? I share a story from my wife with her permission. She's a priest in the Episcopal Church. On vacation this past summer, she did a guest preaching gig at an Episcopal Church in Portland, Oregon, where she's from. <clears throat> the prescribed reading from the scriptures in her tradition for that Sunday was from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 15. And what she picked out and preached on was a part where Jesus says, listen and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person but it is what comes out of the mouth that defiles a person. And her sermon was about fat phobia and how fat people are still the butts of jokes, cruelty, and discrimination, and how that's wrong. She received hate mail about the sermon from people there who weren't even her congregation. She was a guest. The worst was from a professor at a local university who sent an angry, hateful, curse-laden missive that called her, I think, just about every fat slur in the book. Part of what he said was, quote, your taking of the gospel lesson in which Jesus says that righteousness depends on what comes out of our mouth rather than what goes in and turning it into a call for gluttony and obesity was bizarre. This may explain why there are no young people left in our church. Thankfully, my daughter has established good eating and exercise habits, but your call to obesity would have most parents of young people running for the exits. That's about the only quote I could share in public from that email. My wife is a large fat woman and her call to inclusion, kindness, and compassion for fat people resulted in hatred directed at a fat woman for being fat. But there's hope. In 2017, I published a novel about a Catholic high school in Boston. I taught in Catholic high schools for a long time before I became a UU. The title is Saint Somebody Central Catholic, and the title I based on the name of the school in the story, which was some long ago forgotten Irish Catholic saint that no one remembers, as well as the idea that everyone, even the unknown teacher and students in an insignificant high school, are all saints, holy people, lovable, acceptable, valuable. I've always been a universalist at heart, even before I was a Unitarian Universalist. Spoiler alert, it was not a bestseller. And about 18 months after it was published, sales dropped off. And now it's a nice thing I've done with my life. And I can say I have an author page on Amazon, but it fades to the background. However, just after the COVID quarantine began in the winter of 2020, I got a strange email from a woman in Australia named Sophie Henderson Smart offering to buy the domain name of my website for the novel. She needed the domain name for opening a North American branch of her business. Fashion designer Sophie Henderson Smart started a business in Australia in 2018, making top of the line fashion swimwear for plus size women. And she called it Saint Somebody because everyone is beautiful, holy, and special, even fat people. As she says, and I quote her website, inspired by all women in their beautiful, diverse, remarkable bodies, we create pieces that feel incredible to wear. Luxury fashion isn't only for one body type, nor should it dictate how we feel about our bodies. Fashion is about how clothes make us feel. I absolutely loved that when she told me. I told her she could just have the domain name. She didn't need to buy it from me. And I did the paperwork and signed over the rights. 
And she also threw in two or three free swimsuits from the catalog for my wife and had them sent to her. So I traded the domain name for $700 worth of fancy swimwear and the knowledge that I'm not the only person who thinks we're all valuable and lovable and acceptable, whatever our size. Our hymn of celebration today is, uh, I'm sorry, uh, for every woman in the world, I believe, is what we went with. That right, Jerry? <laughs> Correct. Yes. All right. So let's all sing for every woman in the world. If every woman in the world had her mindset on freedom, if every woman in the world dreamed a sweet Please join me in the words for extinguishing our chalice. We extinguish this chalice, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts and out into the world until we are together again. I am light, I am light. I am not the things my family did. I am not the voices in my head. I am not the pieces of the brokenness inside. I am light. I am light. I am of the things that caused me pain. I am not the pieces of the dream I left behind. I am light. I am light. I am I am not the color of my eyes. I am not the skin. 
skin on the outside. I am not my age. I am not my race. My soul is.